So welcome to our session about uh, the Kubernetes environments and the uh, platform decisions makings. Um, I have to admit I've just stepped into this session because unfortunately uh, Jason Root wasn't able to make it today. And uh, so uh, a big hello to, to Jason Root out there. Um, hopefully you're good. <laughs> and um, so um, I'm here and uh, we just lost one speaker, but there are two other speakers on that. Um, we have uh, Tobias Trump, who's uh, yeah, responsible for the uh, um, Kubernetes environment at the BSZ in Germany. And then we have uh, Florian Kraft, who's responsible for the uh, setting up of the Kubernetes environment in the LR, LR set Munich, uh, the Bavarian um, yeah, computing center. And um, so I think we're just gonna take it away. And I think Florian, will you be the first one? Who will mm, present yeah, you, you, you can pass it over to me. Uh, or, oh yeah, oh. <laughs> Has, has, has his, yeah, I, I'm has originally his, has his the organizer of the session. I'm the convener of the SysOp6. Yeah, I have no camera today. It has never happened before, so you can just listen to me. Uh, we had originally three speakers for this session, as Axel already said. And um, it will be about self-deployment in the um, oh, Kubernetes cluster. Is call it Kubernetes? Yes. And what decisions do you have to do? I mean, how do you set up your cluster? What about the infrastructure? What about the networking? But also, how do you deploy? It can be done in many different ways. And um, yeah, many have uh, deployed on Kubernetes and Rancher, but uh, the, the speakers will tell you what are their plans. They are both uh, at the status of setting up, so not, not yet live. Um, let me just quickly show what my institution is doing. Um, so if I may share the screen. Now, we can, can you see a Word document? Yes, we see it. Okay. So my, my institution does not have a cluster, but we have single servers. So uh, actually, there are um, uh, double servers. I have uh, one server for the Okapi and the backend modules and the stripes, and also Kafka is running on this. And um, I have another server for um, the database where the database is running on only the database, um, uh, Postgres. It's not running in a container. And I have a server for the MinIO stuff, which serves all the um, uh, Mendance uh, uh, clients. So I'm the administrator of at, at the moment, six servers. They are always, almost all of the same size. We have Ubuntu, which is usually 20 or 22. As you can see here in the uh, sixth column. And they all have a internal IP address. So they are being served by a reverse proxy, which is called HPZ1, that's my institution, HPZ. And this is the only uh, server which is known to the outside world. And then uh, it's uh, proxying to the other servers uh, via um, by, by, by IP ranges. I mean, by, by the DNS name, of course. But uh, it only lets through certain IP ranges. So... Um, we have one public demo. This is the only one you can uh, pull, uh, call in your browser and you will get a response and you can see with Daiko admin admin, you can log in 
So I show this here in this column. And at the moment I have no Lana, I'm working on the going to uh, Orchid. This only has a minimal set of data. We use this for, uh, if we have new clients to, uh, for, for demos. So we are um, um, a, a service center. We are not a library, we are a regional a service center for libraries. In, in, in this sense, we are a provider. We, we host uh, folio instances. Um, then there's a, there are two servers for client number one, which is at the moment the only client we have in production. As I said, this is all on machines like this, 40 gigabyte RAM, eight virtual CPUs. And this has 225,000 instances and 100,000 items. I, I'm saying this because I know if you have a bigger um, a library, uh, you would not host it on a single server it's not uh, performant, but uh, this has not caused any problems so far. Never, I, I, it's running since uh, almost two years now. I had out of my mind only one and two times to restart a module. It's very, very stable. If I can say this here, you don't need a cluster for this uh, kind of uh, client, for this kind of client. Um, then we have a test client. Um, HPZ5, and I'm running three, no, sorry, we have a test server, and I'm running three clients on this, so that makes a multi-tenancy. And um, one of them is our test client, one of them is a demo client for migration tests, and the other one I use as a test client for an, for an interested library. And again, it has a, at the order of magnitude 100,000 instances, um, and it's not a problem. It's 73,000. And the, the third client, which we have, has 30,000 instances. And um, this was, let me say, the last one who got a, a server on their own, because I plan, I don't want to administer 10 or 20. Uh, like servers, servers which are all of the same, um, you know, dimension, but I will do a multi-tenancy. Well, the plan is to host a couple of small libraries, say maybe five or six with less than 100,000 instances on one server. And if, if one client uh, gets an upgrade to um, another flower release from uh, Nolana to Orchid, then all the other clients will... Um, be upgraded simultaneously. This is, of course, a um, negative point, <laughs> you know, because you have to organize, a, they have a small downtime, it has to be all at the same day. But otherwise, I, I would, as a system administrator, I would, I would say I cannot do this on a single server. If I have uh, five clients on one server and each has um, order of magnitude, what is it, 80? I think 62, 65 modules, you know, if you have only 65, it's not a problem. And, and if it's each of these 65 has, it's been used by five tenants, it's not a problem. But if they have all a different release, you know, then I have five times 65, then I have 300 um, containers. I wouldn't try that one. Maybe it will run with 300, but it will then reach a limit very soon. Um, yeah, that's about all I want to say. I haven't prepared more be uh, because uh, we have uh, speakers. And now, um, Florian, do you want to start? Oh. No, I think it would make, make more sense uh, if, if um, Tobias... Would I will, yeah. I pass it over to Tobias, who plans to yeah. host on um, In golf. cluster. I'll pass will, it back will to you have, Ingolf, Will you have questions afterwards or between the oh, session? After my it? talk. Uh, good I question. mean, sure, if there are questions. Good, good, good question. Yeah, I thought we have a big question session at the end, but you can ask questions now for, for my installations. Yeah, please ask questions. Mm -hmm. So, are there questions, any? Okay. 
So then, okay, then I, I stop this. We can drop over to Tobias. Welcome, Tobias. Um, oh yeah, okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see that. Yes. Okay, and hear me loud and clear. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I'm uh, Tobias Stump, um, as already introduced by uh, Ingolf and uh, Alex. Um, I'm from the data center of uh, the University of Tübingen, and um, I'm a, 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 we are an evaluation partner um, in the project uh, BW Folio, um, which uh, tries to uh, evaluate um, the use, the product, productive use of Folio um, in about or, or for about uh, three years. Um, we are early to the party of Folio. Uh, no, no, we are uh, maybe late to the party of Folio, but uh, <laughs> for us, it's early in the project. And um, um, today, I wanted to. Um, until today, I wanted to to uh, test um, some um, Helm charts or, or application um, uh, scaffolding uh, automated. Uh, um, application scaffolding uh, that what that I wasn't able to um, because we are uh, too early and have uh, decisions to make and uh, um, uh, um, set up requirements hardware requirements um, so but yeah um, take my uh, presentation as a teaser and uh, introduction to uh, why um, uh, what what concerns of a, of a, a kubernetes platform may be or um, what what um, um, what hurdles uh, uh, will come in the way. So um, uh, we, um, who is BW Folio? Um, this is the Southwest German Library Consortium um, that uh, mostly consists of uh, the Library Service Center uh, BSZ, um, the Administrative Office Baden-Württemberg Consortium uh, Ready, and um, the Center for Data Processing, um, which is the hoster uh, at the University of Tübingen for this project. I'm not a librarian. Uh, I came into this project because of interest uh, for the technology. Um, so I, I have not really um, insight or um, the um, uh, uh, the, the aspects that these that these numbers um, give you as a librarian, but um, I wanted to show how large our system is. So um, these are um, numbers for catalog access, uh, um, which are um, of a thousand libraries. Uh, I think this is um, uh, Fernleihe. I don't know if the, the English word right now for this. Um, In interlibrary law. Uh, interlibrary law. Okay, yeah. Um, and this is shared uh, between um, German consortia, uh, SVB and GBV. So um, there are people in the audience um, who uh, are more conserv uh, conversant with this data. Uh, I just wanted to show it. I took a few, some, uh, some uh, key, key, uh, key data. Um, for system administrators, uh, we are running um, uh, a commercial product that's um, uh, named ARDIS, um, yeah, BMS, so um, a library management system. And um, the system consists of uh, about uh, 230 hosts, um, which um, make uh, the library management system available to uh, um, uh, 59 tenants. And the largest system uh, uses about uh, 24 uh, vCPUs and about uh, 128 uh, gigabytes of RAM. Mm -hmm. um, the goal to switch to BW, uh, BW Folio, Folio is um, largely due to uh, scaling concerns. Um, so the, um, at least from the uh, perspective of operation, um, because um, with um, Kubernetes, um, there's a software solution to um, scale application services uh, across several hosts, and um, it, it not only relies on hardware. Um, other points that are interesting um, also for us, but also for the librarians, is uh, data sovereignty. Uh, sovereignty. 
oh, uh, in involvement and contribution and flexibility. So um, to keep the data um, at our service and uh, to um, adjust Folio or the um, um, library management system to the custom needs and uh, also to um, to part uh, participate and, and um, collaborate with uh, with other uh, libraries uh, that or, or concierges that uh, use Folio. The beginning was quite a hurdle uh, for us um, because a, a lot of uh, dependencies that um, to some extent were uh, familiar to us, but um, to some extent were only uh, keywords that we just heard. Um, so um, um, an easy installation, uh, this is the point of, of this slide, is not easily possible. Um, you, you have to um, not only be familiar with uh, a lot of tooling and, and, and uh, dependencies, um, you have to uh, configure this in um, uh, to work together and um, ahead plan uh, production infrastructure or um, evaluation infrastructure, um, which cannot easily uh, be easily made. And um, on top of that, you um, need to be familiar or, or learn um, um, Folio, um, which um, is another aspect from from a system systems administration um, um, as it uh, concerns um, often uh, concerns. Um, uh, knowledge that lab librarians or users of the um, library management software uh, uh, need to have or uh, yeah and um, along that um, that there are hurdles with uh, tooling and, and um, um, uh, uh, tools use components. Um, we want to have um, production ready requirements at, at this um, cluster or, or this, this hosting. So um, the, um, the systems running sh should be high available, high performant, um, mm -hmm. scalable, not in a sense that it's only vertically, but, but also horizontally, which uh, can be provided with hardware, but also uh, with Kubernetes and software. There should be persistency also across disaster. So um, backup plans uh, that allow uh, gradual or um, full, uh, full uh, restores. Um, the cluster should be secure and um, it ideally you, um, should be able to buy um, support or um, offer support, so, so grant support um, and, and guarantees. And um, uh, all of this was, was very confusing and uh, it, it was much. Um, and um, I started to um, to get my head into Folio with uh, docs.folio.org. And um, um, this way improved with contact uh, to sysops, with, uh, which uh, is the Slack channel of uh, um, uh, Ingolf as the convener and uh, many people around that uh, host and uh, evaluate and uh, even run uh, live systems of, of Folio. So, and uh, here's my advice uh, to all of, of the people starting, reach out to, to the community. You'll have questions uh, and they, they can be easy, easily answered. Early findings of ours were, were that um, single server instances uh, require uh, at least uh, 40 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, RAM. So um, the developer boxes in the default settings are set to, I think, eight gigabytes. And um, where it's easy to, to start developer or vagrant uh, pre-built boxes, um, they run into... Um, uh, issues with a startup or with um, with login, even um, starting the the uh, folio application because um, of of um, um, exceeded uh, resources. So um, there's a trade-off between <laughs> running vagrant boxes, uh, which are um, um, in a, a virtual environment uh, that, that may also be nested um, uh, if, if you're uh, running it on your local lat laptop or uh, an, an, a more flexible infrastructure. Um, and also, um, it, these resources are hard to provide for um, consumer hardware. So if you don't already have a, um, a larger setup, server setup. Um, so um, it's hard even to experiment with Folio, um, but um, yeah, so a uh, single server instance um, are, um, or are, um, are documented to, to inst installation in, in uh, ondocs.folio.org. Uh, um, you can follow this quite easily. You still need some, uh, you, you still find uh, to need some uh, configuration options, options dependent on your, your hardware 
or um, um, environment available. So um, for us, it's, it was easiest to um, boot uh, larger uh, virtual machines that um, um, uh, even exceed the, the requirements of 40 gigabyte of RAM and um, uh, vCPUs and uh, to install all um, dependencies, which means Kafka, Postgres, um, Elasticsearch into these virtual machines, um, such that we had a, a closed environment um, or an independent environment, which can be snapshotted, which can be started, stopped, um, which can be easily migrated, uh, which can be um, um, uh, yeah, uh, tweaked even. Um, so, um, um, and, and um, such that um, um, with a snapshot, um, the whole system gets um, uh, um, back up or uh, let, let's say snapshotted, um, including um, all the components which may have uh, um, um, some persistence, uh, uh, persistent data that uh, that's uh, dependent on, on um, other settings or other data in, in the uh, folio um, application. Um, the pre-built vagrant boxes um, built up um, using um, vagrant and, and Ansible, um, and um, I've tried to um, get my knowledge, um, or, or, or find some further knowledge, uh, knowledge um, for installation or configuration um, reading these um, Ansible scripts, and. Um, that was a, or is a chore and even a hurdle for me because um, the, the, the setup is, is uh, really large and even confusing um, not for an expert um, I'm still not sure if, if a single expert um, is able to, to easily um, oversee um, the enti entire vagrant setup so um, these, are hard, these vagrant boxes are hard to, to configure and um, maybe it's easier to um, to just run um, 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 workarounds or uh, even um, uh, changes uh, to um, to um, a compiled and and uh, uh, ready um, uh, uh, ready sources um, that you um, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, for single server instances, uh, you do the whole setup, and um, it's pretty well documented. And um, you'll find how to uh, discover modules, how to install them, and how to um, set custom domains, how to tweak um, 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 performance um, um, uh, requirements, um, res resources, and um, um, it's pretty straightforward to, to, to get your head into Folio and um, the system requirements, the system rec um, um, configuration. With the pre-built vagrant boxes, um, um, the Ansible setup is, is quite complicated. And um, it, um, it's, it's even complicated for expert uh, at Rager. Um, so the finding is also um, uh, what could be heard is with uh, single server instances. Um, um, the problem with those is um, that you have uh, systems that are um, like pets, so not the cattle that you that we're aiming for. Um, so no automation, no uh, declarative setup, no um, um, but also systems that um, um, vary from each other. So uh, which which have other settings or even changes that weren't uh, applied in the setup. So um, and and here um, um, folio and instances. Um, would greatly benefit from a Kubernetes setup, uh, which can be streamlined and um, um, with code, code as a um, in infrastructure as a code. Um, so, say hand charts, um, easily described and even uh, documented with with um, the description of of the setup. Um, yeah, and uh, another point is. Um, we were in conflict between virtualized environment and um, bare metal environments, um, and um, virtualized in, uh, in, uh, in environments uh, benefit from flexibility, uh, easy snapshotting, and um, migration possibilities, um, also encapsulation. Um, yet, bare metal um, instances um, improve on performance and uh, even um, 
um, um, have more resources and um, um, uh, provide pos uh, possibilities with uh, network storage or um, increased net, um, performance on network storage or the like. So uh, there, there's a trade-off, uh, but still in an evaluation phase, uh, you want to re uh, virtualize your system because bare metal could be uh, bothersome um, because you're forced to uh, just run pods and not um, virtualize uh, several clusters, for example, uh, the database outside the cluster, database inside the cluster, and um, uh, this is like, like that. Okay, uh, so um, I've already explained part of this. Um, for your benefits, um, when running on Kubernetes for task automation, um, so um, there could be plans, uh, infrastructure as a code that um, define and, and template uh, setups of Folio. So um, for different uh, tenants, you could easily um, um, set up two clusters, uh, two, uh, two Folio uh, instances, um, just with, with templating and um, adjusting uh, configuration like uh, uh, titles, um, um, modules applied um, or the like. Um, with modular configuration um, and, and as, as um, with Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes you um, deploy the component, um, you describe the, the uh, components um, in a declarative way, uh, you're also documenting already um, um, your setup, um, which is a benefit. Um, Kubernetes allows for horizontal scaling, so um, not just increasing a single machine um, with RAM or more CPUs, so moving to larger systems, um, but Kubernetes is designed to um, um, to um, span across different uh, compute nodes um, so uh, that a system is, is, uh, will increase with adding systems, uh, and not just um, in, enlarging systems. And um, ease of use, um, which is uh, quite a funny because uh, Kubernetes is a very complex setup, which we'll see later um, uh, with Florian. But um, when it's running, if the platform is, is um, uh, if, if platform decisions are made, and if you have a um, Kubernetes setup running, um, you'll benefit greatly from declarative uh, infrastructure from a setup that's, that is documented, that is uh, in, in repositories. Um, yeah. And uh, you gain flexibility with uh, templating. Um, so you, you'll have uh, schemas that provide you um, to only make a certain change, but otherwise build systems um, of the same structure. OK, so um, what are easy <laughs> Kubernetes setups uh, or easy Kubernetes uh, clusters? Uh, examples could be Minikube or Microcades. Uh, which with with I've uh, worked um, um, for uh, pretty early with my um, head into Kubernetes, um, but lately I've uh, was introduced by Florian um, um, in the last week um, to Kubespray, which um, is a, an Ansible setup um, a repository that um, even builds up uh, a production ready uh, Kubernetes cluster. So um, here's just just the advice and um, the um, um, yeah, I, I, I want to um, um, introduce you to to a test out and um, uh, Kubernetes and, and and just get it running uh, experiment with it, um, which can be easily done with all of, of these projects here. Okay, um, Kubernetes um, still is. Um, troublesome in the setup, um, um, even if you disregard, um, or even if you just disregard um, um, the setup of, of um, Kubernetes uh, at itself, um, because um, there's some design decisions to, to run Folio. Um, you could uh, run Folio in an, uh, a single namespace and all its comp components in, in a single namespace, so uh, an, an isolated environment in, in Kubernetes. Uh, and um, this vastly directs the amount of RAM because um, the largest component of Folio um, uh, regarding RAM is, um, is a 
ähm, ist die Kubernetes, uh, uh, sorry, ist die PostgreSQL Database, um, which can easily amount to um, more than 25 uh, plus gigabytes of RAM. And um, a module uh, spans about two gigabytes of RAM, um, which um, you may have available in different versions. And um, there's also uh, Elasticsearch, uh, which can be uh, two to three different, uh, uh, two to three gigabytes of RAM per um, replica. And also, um, yeah, um, Florian will, will show this later. Um, I think uh, if I recall this correctly, his setup uh, is about uh, 100 gigabytes per RAM uh, per namespace. So um, running Folio instance that uh, includes all the um, uh, dependencies and components. Uh, another um, aspect of, uh, of a decision that you have to make is um, persistent storage. Um, so um, Kubernetes is um, storage agnostic <laughs> to some sense. Um, it has no, no meaning of uh, persistent data um, to begin with. Um, so um, containers or pods that are running on a cluster um, can, easily, uh, can be easily replicated because um, or um, distributed across uh, different compute nodes because um, um, there's no data in it that, um, that that's not available um, <laughs> to the to the entire cluster or um, to um, yeah um, so um, if running um, a web app for example um, this can be easy, easily distributed um, is only Apache and Apache service this could be easily um, um, distributed across uh, um, different compute nodes if it's static. So if it all serves uh, the same content on, on every system and every node. So um, when um, 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 when when balancing um, the ingress, um, it doesn't matter which uh, where the the, in, um, the ingress is um, linked to. So uh, which um, container or pod will answer the, the request. Um, if, if the, the data is static and, and just can be booted up in a container. Um, a database is a um, violation of that. So uh, a database um, will have uh, or, or requires persistent storage uh, or a dy dynamic uh, web app also. Um, so uh, there must be some sense of, of persistent uh, storage. And uh, this can be network, network storage, which is available uh, next to the cluster, uh, Kubernetes cluster. But this can also be local storage, which is only available on one node of the Kubernetes cluster. So um, the last uh, the example of the, uh, the last one would be um, local storage, which, which is really a folder on uh, the local um, operating system uh, and um, a database which requires on this local storage uh, would be restrict restricted uh, restricted to only run on this node. So um, we'll see later um, in Florian's setup uh, that he has a database uh, uh, running in in its uh, Kubernetes cluster. So we'll learn about uh, more about this. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and um, we've also wanted to introduce and test um, hand charts, um, which um, apply or um, set up a, a folio um, instance or a folio application on Kubernetes, um, which the LSZ and Florian Kraft um, um, greatly uh, built up and um, tested on. And um, the idea behind this uh, is um, as soon as you, um, there's a Kubernetes cluster running, um, that's the, the part where Kubernetes becomes easy. Um, the, um, Helm charts, um, which are, um, Helm is a package manager for um, Kubernetes. So um, Helm charts um, would allow to have applications as proposed by the tech council and um, uh, when spar to some extent, so it, it, it would be easy to to deploy um, a running folio instance on Kubernetes with with just the launch of of uh, um, install folio. <laughs> uh, it's not as easy um, as it sounds because uh, you have uh, um, uh, um, you you um, have to provide um, 
the storage classes to Kubernetes. Uh, you have to um, um, have enough um, resources, which which are RAM and, and, and storage. Um, but um, in principle, um, it would be an easy aim to to, um, um, to form modules, find correct settings, to collaborate and refine on on these. Uh, hand charts um, and then share it for a collective um, automation declaration of uh, for your setups. And um, I was not ready to um, test this out um, this week due to um, um, hurdles in our project, um, but we'll uh, do the next week and the following. And um, yeah, I hope uh, Florian will introduce you to some of it uh, in his uh, talk. Thank you, everyone. Um, other questions? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, other questions? There's one question. Wait. In, in the chat? Where is it? Um, hi, Tobias. Uh, oh, hi. I heard um, about your uh, experiences with the, and your drawbacks with the, uh, putting a database within the cluster, but uh, have you considered um, just uh, isolating the database outside of the cluster? And if you have considered that, uh, what are the pros and cons, uh, which is still, uh, I'm not sure whether you have uh, completely decided to put the database, run the database uh, within the cluster also in your production system. But um, um, my question is, if you are moving the database out of the cluster, have you? What, what would you say are the pros and cons of doing that? Uh, moving out the database of the cluster um, has the pros that you uh, that Kubernetes doesn't need to depend very greatly on persistent storage. So um, the Kubernetes setup um, simplifies uh, with. Uh, not having available persistent storage in, in the cluster. Um, disadvantages may be that um, you have to take care of um, replication of the database for yourself. Um, so um, Kubernetes automatically orchestrates um, the running instance of, of, of um, Postgres. So um, if one um, node dies, it will easily, easily up fire up another. Um, if um, the storage um, that um, that is connected to Kubernetes um, is redundant or can be attached to several uh, nodes, um, <laughs> Postgres is, is automatically available um, <laughs> to be high available, to be redundant. So, um, yeah. Other aspects which uh, can be considered are... Um, um, the connectivity speed or the performance that um, um, the systems may have. Um, so an external database, which um, can be um, can can have a performance issue due to um, um, link speed that's not enough. Um, so our part link speed uh, speed um, local storage um, could be way more uh, performant. Um, uh, in this aspect. So, um, but also um, I have to um, reference here to um, Florian, um, which is um, an institution uh, with the LS LS set that has um, the um, Postgres uh, database inside the cluster. Uh, if I recall correctly, um, most, if not all of the system uh, sysop groups otherwise um, have chosen to, um, to run the database uh, Externally, so uh, next to Kubernetes as an external resource. Yes, I will probably go a bit um, into depth in my presentation anyway. So um, I could say something to that effect uh, right now. You're welcome. Um, free, free, free. free. Um, the, so one uh, definitely crucial aspect is the performance. The, it's um, Kubernetes storage tuning is simply an added complexity layer um, because you need a uh, storage uh, driver, which then has to be uh, in some way interfaced with, with hardware if you um, deploy on bare metal. And that can have performance um, penalties. Um, that's something 
we have not completely um, uh, finished our testing on um, and maybe we'll we'll change around some of the settings but we are relatively committed um, on running postgres in the cluster be uh, because of the benefits um, which are easier high availability automatic um, failover and stuff like that um, already integrated uh, backups to s3 storage um, um, all of that there are several project projects i think um, which which um, provides uh, stuff like that um, we chose the salando postgres operator um, which uh, seems to fit our needs so you basically need to um, try to evaluate um, uh, what kind of um, performance you you get and what kind of um, also uh, management benefits you could get from running in it inside the cluster but even inside the cluster postgres is relatively hard to to optimize and and try to keep uh, running stable so yeah hard to say <laughs> Maybe as a side note, uh, the Postgres operator is a system uh, developed by, by um, uh, sorry, Salando operator is a system developed by Salando to uh, keep uh, Postgres databases in sync. So, um, yes. um, yeah. Um, and also regarding uh, uh, network storage or local storage, um, we've benchmarked um, our um, storage unit uh, that, that we've ordered and um, with one link had about um, um, seventy percent of the of, of the speed that a local um, SSD drive, uh, so all, uh, a flash drive, uh, um, performs. Um, with two links and uh, jumbo frames, uh, we were able to um, um, increase, so have uh, seven times uh, the speed of uh, local SSD storage. So, uh, be because um, the, the network storage um, has great links and also has. Uh, um, a, um, a rate of um, flash storage, um, so um, uh, it can paralyze reading and writing. Um, so um, it's not necessary that uh, local storage uh, is, is the fastest. Um, it's a thing to experiment um, also with, with the hardware available. Um, and uh, yeah, um, there's a grain of salt. Um, it was just only benchmarks with the uh, um, network and uh, disk uh, benchmarking tools. Um, so um, a benchmark uh, that's uh, close to the application level or application um, uh, um, requirements um, it could um, speak other truth. So, <laughs> um, um, yeah. So um, we need st we still need to benchmark um, um, a Postgres um, um, benchmark or a pos Postgres operations that are um, attached to um, network storage and uh, also where Postgres is uh, inside a Kubernetes cluster or where Postgres is not. So uh, to have comparable data. I think. We don't have any other questions. Ingolf has raised hands. Yeah, I would have a question. There's no question from the okay. audience. Um, I was thinking about your RAM calculations. Can, can you show the slide again? And where you say each module has two gigabyte RAM. So, I mean, what what does it mean? How can I run a single server with the sixty-five modules if I only have sixty-five? Uh, sorry, if I only have forty gigabytes RAM, what does it mean? Does it mean uh, okay? It is eats up all this RAM or what? Yeah, no, no. Um, uh, where was the slide? You know, it, I would say it depends on on your load, how much RAM the, yeah. this module takes. How can you uh, say? Of course, um, the default settings for for, for uh, modules typically typically is about um, up to 512 uh, megabytes. Um, but mm -hmm. some don't run stable in it. Um, Mud Agreements is an example for this. Um, and this greatly benefits from um, higher RAM uh, settings, um, um, which then could be easily spent uh, to uh, two or four uh, gigabytes of RAM. And um, if, if there are replicas of this module, um, it, it's a factor of, of the replicas. 
Um, so is that a calculation? If I, you say, if I, that's a um, configuration of the module, a parameter, 500? Yeah, they are, yes. Megabyte, what? So if I have 65 models, modules, I can it's, it occupy 32 gigabyte. Is that a calculation? So I, I know when I have 80 modules, yeah. I'm on the limit, the 40 gigabyte server. I think so, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, also, maybe that's another insight that uh, just comes to my mind. Um, I thought that um, increasing RAM for med modules is, is an, an, a fix to all problems, um, but it is not due to um, a garbage collection of, of uh, Java mm -hmm. programs. So um, if a module has too much RAM, RAM it will... Um, um, <laughs> It will start to con consume uh, this RAM up, and at some point, uh, will will notice uh, that there aren't uh, further resources available, and will start to garbage collect, uh, mm -hmm. which then will introduce some phenomenon uh, phenomenon that's uh, um, stop okay. the world from phenomenon. Uh, so it stops all code execution for this moment um, to to free up RAM, and um, mm -hmm. if if the the RAM uh, is, is is larger for the module or, or too large. Um, um that means um <laughs> the stop stopped uh, execution um will take longer um um because yeah. uh, um freeing up ram uh, will take longer yeah but i still don't agree with this because i do upgrades and i have the double number i have 130 modules it it, it works <laughs> it, it it cannot be that each module takes uh, no, no. It, it, it's not that every module takes that much RAM. Most uh, um, need way, way fewer RAM. Like uh, yeah. some need only, um, I think, at the lowest is 100 megabytes, but uh, um, most uh, lose less than one, uh, half a gigabyte. And um, ah, so okay. it, it, is a, uh, it is a problem or it has to be taken in a, into account that you need to uh, sometimes run more than one instance of the module and need, need to run several versions if you want to upgrade. Um, so that's something you need to have enough headroom, I guess. Um, but most uh, modules take uh, don't don't need that much RAM. I think the that, default that, that's not an, that's not an average value to gigabyte RAM. No, 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 no. I think we have uh, up to. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah that's we, an have, up to. we have we have uh, modules which take more than two gigabytes, but that's the exception. Mm -hmm. I, I don't remember we we had to manually increase um, the RAM of uh, some of the modules. Um, but the baseline values are actually documented in the module descriptors and the GitHub of the, the modules themselves. So if you want to yes. uh, calculate the, the like default RAM, uh, you simply have to go through all of those and add them up or something like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And in single server setups, I found um, 40 gigabytes of RAM to be sufficient. I've also found this for um, Vagrant boxes. Um, but with Vagrant boxes, we had um, issues with um, nested uh, KW, uh, KVM, so uh, nested virtual machines, which um, mm -hmm. greatly impacted performance. So they, they were even unusable um, because of two uh, virtualization layers. Yes. Double so virtualization, um, yes. Yeah, and, and, and I've said this earlier, or, or tried to, to um, um, make this point, that um, it's a trade-off uh, between bare metal um, performance Mm -hmm. um, but missing flexibility of, of different setups and snapshotting uh, versus um, a setup that's uh, layered into virtualization or containers even. So, um, yeah. No, yeah, thank you. Okay, maybe okay. maybe I should start my talk yes. and try to keep it relatively mm -hmm. short that we can uh, go to more questions. Questions are more interesting anyway, but yeah. uh, trust that we have um, my presentation as well. Um, I think I would share my screen. I've stopped sharing. Perfect. Um, okay. Is this working? I don't know. Uh, Can you see my yes. screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. 
So, um, Tobias already introduced me. Um, I'm, I'm Florian Kraft. I'm working for the Leibniz Supercomputing Center in Bavaria, Germany. Um, and um, we are currently hosting quite a few folio testing instances. Sadly, um, Jason Root uh, could not be with us today. He's the, um, I guess, expert on actually running uh, self-hosting uh, production of, um, folio instances on Kubernetes. Um, but I guess you have to join us in our SysOps sessions if you want to hear uh, more um, uh, 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 from him. We are um, responsible for the IT infrastructure um, of um, quite a few ac academic libraries in Bavaria uh, for the uh, Bibliotheksverbund Bayern, it's like uh, the Bavarian consortium of uh, uh, academic libraries. Um, and uh, during the next few years, um, uh, quite a few of those acad academic libraries, or most, uh, I guess, want to transition to Folio, with the first um, production instance planned already uh, uh, in October this uh, year, but only with the ERM uh, part. We are currently running quite a few Kubernetes clusters on um, mostly bare metal servers um, with um, a control plane uh, in virtual machines, uh, simply uh, for redundancy reasons. Um, and two of those are almost completely dedicated to Folio. So um, one of those will uh, be transitioned to a production cluster and one be, will be a testing cluster that, that they are completely separate, uh, running on completely separate hardware. Um, currently, they are already running five uh, Folio inst instances. Um, we have um, old instances running with uh, Kiwi and Lotus um, still, and have Nolana and Orchid instances. And um, for example, the newest Orchid instance um, has uh, 16 different uh, tenants. So um, not 16 different libraries, but um, uh, uh, sometimes um, for the same library, multiple tenants, but we, we have um, multi-tenant systems running. Mm -hmm. So that's the point of view. We, I'm also uh, not a librarian. Um, I'm working for the, the computing center. Um, so, so some of the folio specific or library specific stuff I'm, I'm not too uh, familiar with. But if you want to run folio, I think you need to have a basic understanding to even start uh, troubleshooting. So you need like interdisciplinary knowledge. Um, Okay, um, I will keep this one short because uh, Tobias already mentioned it. Um, why even use Kubernetes? Kubernetes uh, introduces quite a bit of complexity and, and uh, additional knowledge you need to have, but it's the de facto standard for container orchestration, which means um, scheduling and self healing and um, a management of um, applications which run in container. And Folio is designed as a container based microservice architecture. So the um, Kubernetes is actually perfect, uh, perfectly suited for Folio. So most components of Folio um, are uh, a container or can be run in containers. Um, uh, Okapi, Stripes, and all the backend, uh, so the, the front end, the API, API gateway, and all the backend modules are already containerized. Um, in our case, we are also running all the other direct infrastructure requirements of Folio, which are um, the Postgres database, the uh, Kafka, Elasticsearch, and even the S3 storage. Um, uh, we run all of those in container-based solutions as well. Um, um, one big advantage or i guess the, the the two main advantages of kubernetes are scalability and high availability so um to visualize some of the points tobias already made um here is an example set of of, of um, three kubernetes nodes and all of the different parts that are needed for um folio can be run on uh, distributed on different nodes and scaled up or down. And if one of the nodes um, simply dies, for example, it should not be um, 
uh, e even be realized by the end users because all of the self-healing capabilities of Kubernetes uh, simply keep the system running. That's at least the, the idea and the benefit. So, um, mm -hmm. for example, Elasticsearch and Kafka have um, different charts or different uh, parts where the data gets distributed and uh, there's re redundancy. The backend med modules can be uh, uh, distributed across several nodes for um, performance reasons, so to distribute the load on the servers. And um, for example, in our case, we also run the database um, on different nodes in the cluster. Um, so, for example, if the da database node uh, is not available for some reason, there should be automatic um, failover to to the, to a replica. Yeah. The next point I wanted to address is why self-host uh, Kubernetes. So um, most of mm -hmm. the commercial providers, I think, are using AWS or so a hosted public cloud. Um, but um, I think Tobias already mentioned this as well. Um, there's a big problem with uh, hosting um, a folio on AWS in Europe, at least, because of data, data sovereignty. So we even have laws against um, running st uh, stuff like this uh, in, in uh, Amazon. So I guess you um, in some way have to familiarize yourself with, with this kind of hosting or find um, uh, a hoster um, in Germany, at least, um, I think. I'm not too sure on the actual laws, but data sovereignty is uh, uh, a big concern. Then you also have the most flexibility. For example, um, I won't be going too much in our hardware setup because it's uh, frankly not uh, optimal. Most of our clusters, even the uh, coming production clusters, are running on old hardware. Um, so servers which aren't... Um, being maintained, um, basically, but the the uh, giant benefit of uh, Kubernetes is that all of the systems are redundant. So um, we have quite a few servers which are um, which have storage and which um, is are integrated in the into the Kubernetes cluster. So even if uh, if some some of the nodes in our case, because um, we have most of this stuff in uh, on bare metal Kubernetes servers. Um, are not uh, essential um, for running the system. So if one of those dies, or even two or three, uh, mm -hmm. there shouldn't be any problems uh, with um, uh, in operation. Um, also down the line, we um, once we actually realize what some of the performance bottlenecks are, we can um, scale up specific hardware. For example, um, probably one of the uh, bottlenecks we have currently are the network cards in our uh, servers. Um, and w when we have the, the funds for that and uh, can order them, we can simply add uh, uh, additional network cards or additional servers which have faster st storage, uh, exam for example, and we can integrate those into already running systems. Um, one additional advantage, which is um, one part why we also host Postgres on Kubernetes, is that we we need to familiarize our, uh, ourselves with Kubernetes anyway, and then we can benefit uh, from the Kubernetes complexity across all the related infrastructure. So Kafka, Elasticsearch, Postgres, the um, S3 storage, and um, in the future, maybe even the, the OPAC, uh, which will be viewfind for in our case, probably we can also run um, on, on Kubernetes. Um, yeah, and you avoid uh, cloud vendor login. So I think that was um, one of the points last year, you basically are bound to AWS and their pricing. And some, for example, the, the database, I think was uh, relatively expensive uh, continuously. In our case, the expenses come more um, in, in chunks. So we obviously need to uh, have the hardware in place and then knowledge and uh, manpower to actually manage that. So, it's, so even if you um, self-hosted yourself with um, open source software, which doesn't uh, require any licenses, there are costs, but they aren't. Um, you aren't locked into AWS. And I also uh, already touched on the drawbacks. Um, it adds another layer of complexity to an already relatively complex uh, application um, or several applications like Folio. 
and um, somebody needs to maintain that. So that's um, you need quite a bit of time to even get started with, the, with this system, and then you need the people to maintain it. Okay. I will um, mostly go into the infrastructure technologies that we use, but I won't be going too in depth um, into this because it will simply take up too much time. But I've compiled uh, like lists of technologies we use and. Um, for example, we use Elasticsearch and Kafka in already pre-packaged uh, Helm uh, versions. Um, the Tobias already touched on Helm. It's like a package manager. Um, so we have one configuration file each for Elasticsearch and Kafka, which needs to be tuned to the environment it's installed. And then we basically execute one command and we have a running Elasticsearch instance, for example, with different charts and uh, the data is distributed uh, uh, across different nodes and all the components like um, the, the controllers for Elasticsearch and all of that get installed automatically. You still need to be quite familiar with the applications, but at least the installation and then maintenance are, um, are helped. Also, the up upgrade processes of the, the infrastructure uh, technologies. And then something I already um, got into a little bit is that we are um, currently settled on the Zalando Postgres operator. So this is um, operators um, next to Helm, another concept in Kubernetes, which um, runs more complex applications. So an operator is a separate container which um, tries to monitor the status of an installation. In the case of Postgres, um, the main uh, point is that um, you have a master and a replica, and uh, when the operator is correctly running, in theory, you don't have to um, interact with the system at all when, when the master fails, for example, or restarts. The operator should um, automatically uh, initiate failovers uh, depending on timeouts and stuff like that. Um, so it's um, Helm is like a package uh, manager, and the operator has a bit more logic on, on top of that um, to, to simplify the concept. Um, then we also run our S3 storage, which um, is used uh, internally in um, Folio by um, some components, but which we also use for backups. We run that in our own clusters as well. Um, uh, they have an op official operator for that. Then to even get a bit more um, low level than the, the already mentioned technologies, for Kubernetes deployment itself, we use Kubespray, which is um, Ansible based, um, as Tobias already mentioned. That's simply something uh, my team here had already familiarity with, um, and it provides the possibility for quite a few configuration options in, in Kubernetes and also uh, adding and um, removing nodes and upgrading the Kubernetes uh, version that's all, all integrated into this software. What I think is a bit more widespread is um, Rancher. So Kubespray is pretty vanilla uh, Kubernetes um, with uh, relatively minimal. Rancher has um, something like, for example, a dashboard and um, some functionality on top of that, but could be easier uh, to start out with if you don't already have a Kubernetes cluster. Rancher is also the technology um, Jason Root uses in uh, Tameu. Then for Kubernetes storage provider, we settled on Longhorn, which is actually part of or was part of the Rancher project because it's simply relatively uh, easy to manage and open EBS local LVM for um, localized storage. So Longhorn is a replicated storage, um, which is slower than uh, local storage. And if you have a distributed ap application, which um, takes uh, care of uh, the redundancy of the data itself, it's more efficient to simply use um, local uh, storage, which is only on available on the node. And then we also use uh, in Nginx ingress controller and cert manager to um, manage ingress from the outside. So if you uh, the the cluster itself talks um, in, in a closed network, you can't access it from from the outside, it's blocked by firewall in our case. So we, we have a separate subnet for our Kubernetes cluster. Um, but obviously, you need at least uh, access to 
uh, the stripes front end and Okapi from the outside, and you need to have um, certificates for that, TLS certificates. And there are um, automatic uh, methods where you can renew and get these certificates um, without manual intervention um, if they uh, time out and stuff like that. That's provided by Cert Manager. Then I want to get a bit more in depth into the Helm uh, 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 stuff. So, in general, um, or the the core, which is the reason why we use Helm, is that you can have templates for Kubernetes resources. I'm not sure. Um, can you actually read the images here? <laughs> I don't know uh, how the room yes, uh, looks. Yes. Yes. Um, yep. What I want to mention uh, um, uh, at this point, I think, is that you can also download the slides already. I have um, uploaded the, the current version of the slides to the schedule um, of the Wolfcon. So if you can't read something, you ca can simply download this or look at it later. Um, so Helm uses templates um, for the the Kubernetes manifest. So Kubernetes manifests is, are basically the configurations of all the components of Kubernetes, all the objects that 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 uh, Kubernetes manages are um, configured via YAML manifests. And Helm provides a, uh, the ability to write templates for those manifests and then later fill those with um, so-called value files, which are sim simply variables. So the, the easiest example, if you can read this is here, we, we can have um, a, a configuration file where the copy port is, is, um, uh, is, is, is somehow um, saved and then you only need to, um, to insert that uh, into the uh, template and then in theory you could have uh, multiple copies running. That's um, helpful if you have uh, uh, several instances, but it's even more helpful if you have, for example, an instance with uh, several stripes running. Then uh, the, you have one stripes template, which um, uh, takes care of the basic configuration options of the, the front end container. And then you fill that out with um, stuff like the uh, uh, URLs and ports and environment variables, which match um, to that tenant. Um, I have some examples here, which I actually won't get too in, in depth here because I don't think we have the time. Um, you can, uh, take those as examples and simply ask questions if uh, anything is interesting here. But I, I think I will skip that here. But what I will get into is the folio helm chart uh, we developed ourselves here at LRZ and what the current status of that is. But because that's something that could be helpful for people who want to try, who can get their hands on some kind of Kubernetes um, uh, cluster, either self-deploy on some kind of uh, virtualized ma machines or even bare metal servers or get that from, for example, uh, some computing center, which aren't uh, librarians. And then the idea would be of our Helm charts that you have a complete um, folio installation relatively fast because that's um, actually a, a huge hurdle, even if you already have a Kubernetes um, a cluster. Um, so. The, 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 currently, the installation of Okapi, uh, the backend modules, and uh, multiple tenants are supported and compatible uh, Postgres, Kafka, and Elasticsearch configurations for our infrastructure are provided. And it, uh, this has been in development for uh, way over a year now, closer to one and a half, I think. But it's still only tested here at LRZ, so there's probably quite a few environment dependencies. Um, like Tobias already said, we wanted to try that uh, across completely different environments before Wolfcon, but it simply uh, we ran out ran out of time. That's something we will be getting into the, in the next uh, few weeks, uh, though. What the prerequisites for the Helm charts are is that you already have a a cluster with persistent storage, which can be a hurdle all on it itself, but it's out of scope for that project. 
and you also need um, some kind of way to interact with uh, with Folio. But I guess that could be optional if you uh, simply want to see if you can install it. And then um, it's a, a bit harder to get uh, to the front end, but it uh, can be used. But you also need a container registry because. <clears throat> Stripes need to, uh, needs to build, be built specific for each tenant, or at least um, uh, adjusted somewhat. So we have GitLab for our own container registry because we already had a running GitLab instance. Um, yeah, there's also still some manual setup uh, needed for S3 credentials, and like I said, the, the Stripes uh, build needs to. Uh, be adjusted and built uh, from scratch. Uh, Okapi, the backend modules and all the other stuff could be, um, I guess, pulled from official sources uh, like Docker Hub. Yeah, we will test this. There is all so already um, the very prototype of the Helm charts um, under this URL. So uh, GitLab LZDE uh, bib. Um, uh, dash public slash folios uh, dash helm. That's um, currently quite out of date because I, I uh, updated that last time uh, last year for last WolfCon and I uh, didn't get around to update this with all the improvements since then up until now because um, there was simply no reason to. So the the test with Tobias will will change that. So. That's why I wrote, keep an eye on uh, this. There will be changes and uh, you can uh, reach out if if something seems interesting or you want to try that. Um, then in, on the horizon is an integration into uh, the official installation routine. But for that, it needs to be tested in more than just our environment. Yeah, like I said, uh, if if there's interested interest in this topic, please reach out because it's additional work to to check all uh, um, the, the the development we have made here. If, uh, if you can make it public, um, but if if there's interest in this topic, um, join SysOps, message me directly, uh, whatever. I'm always um, interested in uh, input and more people trying out the concepts I'm, I'm working with um, because that's, that's uh, that will benefit all of us in the future, hopefully. Then I have, um, how much time is left? 15 minutes, we should have 10 yeah, minutes for discussion. I, 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 I'll go over the last few points really quickly um, because there are several um, additional concerns uh, regarding observability and alerting. There will be quite a few logs generated by all the containers and you need to search them, uh, uh, have a way to search them reliably uh, for errors. Um, you also need to have uh, some kind of alerting in place to um, catch er issues um, regarding performance or even um, failing stuff uh, early bec before something fails. Um, we will be using or we are using a separate Elasticsearch instance for logs and will probably be using Prometheus with Grafana that's simply uh, Kubernetes, relatively Kubernetes native and uh, widely used. Um, we also have made quite a few backup and restore uh, improvements uh, over the last year. Uh, the uh, new Postgres operator, for example, provides full and logical backups uh, to S3 support and point in time recovery relatively easily. So um, that, that's uh, actually really nice. We also back up all the Kubernetes configurations and volumes with a combination of Velero and Longhorn snapshots. Um, so these are basically quite a few keywords you can Google and uh, look into if you are at that point, but I won't uh, be getting more in depth uh, into that here. Um, yeah, are there any questions regarding any of these topics? Um, if, if you run out of time, always uh, it's always possible to join SysOps and ask any kind of questions. Or, like I said, message me directly if it uh, makes sense. Yeah. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you. Other questions? Not at the room. Any questions online, perhaps? 
Uh, Ingo, yes, is there I have a question. Uh, so, sorry, on, um, what can the helm chart really do? I mean, so far, I'm mm -hmm. I'm aware it can deploy a module, and now I understood it can deploy a complete tenant, and it can even deploy a complete multi-tenant system. Is it all correct? Can you do everything yes. with helm charts? Yes. What else? Cool. <laughs> so, okay. um, it's a combination of um, uh, persistent installations in Kubernetes, which are called uh, deployments uh, most of the time, or pods that keep running. And then we have quite a bit of the setup you, you would usually do manually with some kind of API tool, for example, uh, adding all the modules to uh, or installing a tenant, adding the uh, the permissions to the admin user and stuff like that. We have all of that automated in bash scripts, which then uh, are run in Kubernetes jobs. So, uh, the, mm -hmm. the installation is automated uh, to a point where you have like um, five or six commands and then you should have a running um, uh, folio instance. So folio with Elasticsearch, Kafka, Postgres, uh, uh, Tenant with Stripes, uh, which you can access via HTTPS from the outside. But that's for our environment. Mm -hmm. um, so currently, it's really hard to tell how good this will work um, for different environments. But the goal is that it uh, should be relatively environment agnostic. Cool. So it's uh, this is modular. You, well, one yes. Helm chart calls another one. Um, one big cur chart, currently, or... currently, that process is manual. So, um, currently, you would install the the baseline components like Elasticsearch, Kafka, and uh, Postgres for first. So, Elasticsearch, mm -hmm. Kafka are different helm charts anyway. Then Postgres is installed, which already creates Okapi and Folio um, databases and creates users, which can then be used um, in subsequent jobs. So, the idea we had here was keep the Helm installation separate. So there will be one Helm installation per tenant, one Helm installation mm -hmm. for Okapi, at least one Helm installation, most most of the time two or more for the backend modules. Um, and you can okay. uh, really, uh, currently uh, the way it's used is that you would install of, all of this um, uh, separately and then check if everything's running correctly. So historically, uh, we had problems with trying to do too much at once. And uh, okay. for example, you don't want to change uh, the the backend module deployments when you add another tenant, for example. So in this in this case, the logical um, separation makes sense. So tenants, each tenant has their own Helm installation, so you can uninstall and deinstall, upgrade those separately. Um, and um, some of the backend components are also separated, so that you can upgrade them separately. For example. Per flower release, we usually have one set of backend modules which get uh, installed as one Helm installation. But uh, the re recent security patches and uh, critical security patches were installed as separate Helm installations. This way, we have a multi-tenant system. We can upgrade some of the tenants uh, before the others, then some of the modules run in parallel. Once all the the the, mod, uh, the tenants are upgraded, you can shut down uh, the unused uh, modules. Currently, all of this is um, manual. The goal would be to automate this, so so to have some kind of logic. Uh, are the backend modules still in use? If not, shut them down and mm -hmm. stuff stuff like this. But th th that's on the horizon. That's the earliest next year, maybe even later. Cool. Just a technical question. What do you mean with namespace? Also, um, ah, um, that's a good point. Tobias used that. Oh. Yes, uh, uh, Kubernetes, it's a basic um, logical separation of applications and containers in, in Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is uh, separated um, on the basic level in namespaces. Kubernetes has this, um, so one point even earlier, Kubernetes has, has its own uh, domain name system. So each namespace would be like a subdomain of, of a domain. Um, would it be a tenant? What is it? I mean, um, in our case, one the whole folio installation is in one namespace. 
Mm -hmm. So it's something you have to decide uh, for yourself. Um, most of the Kubernetes uh, system relevant stuff is in its own namespace, so it can't be interacted or it, 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 it is not interfered with uh, uh, other stuff. Operators are usually in their separate namespaces, and in our case, different folio instances run in uh, different namespaces, so they don't, they don't interact. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's okay. um, a logical separation. It can also be a security separation if you set it, uh, uh, set it up like that, so that one namespace can't access another namespace. In our case, there are several reasons why we actually want that behavior. For example, our S3 storage, so min, min IO, is installed in one namespace, but the folio uh, modules which need S3 storage can access <laughs> But it's mm -hmm. in a separate separate namespace, so it's it's logically separated. So you say you have four Kubernetes clusters, two of which are Folio, and these have then again a structure with namespaces. Yes, we have quite mm -hmm. a few namespaces. So we have uh, the third manager runs in in the namespace. We have some quite a few monitoring namespaces, and we have. Several uh, folio namespaces will for more or less permanent tests um, initially separated by version, but we want to transition to in-place upgrades. So the newer namespaces, uh, in this case, are named folio test, uh, folio temp for stuff that can be deleted. And then uh, mm -hmm. there's three storages separately. Then uh, there's a backup, uh, the namespace for the um, backup uh, stuff that needs to run on the cluster and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we have a logging uh, namespace. Yeah. So that's simply a Kubernetes concept. But co Kubernetes itself is relatively complex. If you want to get into it's it's easy to understand the base con concepts, but each concept is a rabbit hole for itself. So um, what you see here is the the uh, I guess native Kubernetes dash dashboard. And you can see here mm -hmm. quite a few um, like names of uh, objects, uh, object classes in uh, Kubernetes. For example, ingresses are used to uh, get to the cluster from the outside, from outside the clusters. Um, and um, each ingress uh, uses an ingress class, so you can uh, change the, be the behavior depending on, for example, IP ranges. We have um, an ingress class which can only be accessed from inside our computing center. And then we have an ingress class which can be accessed from, uh, uh, I think, all of Bavaria at least. And uh, we can decide on a service by service basis, basis if um, w who needs to have access for that. For example, and um, like you can see here, there's quite a bit of uh, different configuration stuff, different cluster wide stuff. Uh, the nodes themselves um, are, are also here. So this is, for example, our main folio cluster has something like 20 servers almost currently. Um, yeah. Well, this is not in the Nginx. How do you run the Nginx the Stripes container as a container in so Stri the Stripes container is uh, simply a container. Um, it's simply a pod here. So pod is the a pod can be more than one container, but typically it's at least it's, it's one container which does something. For example, we have here. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that, uh, this is the the internal testing Stripes. This is simply um, so. The actual configuration Kubernetes internally has quite a bit of information and stuff like this. But the the basic basics is you you define here which container runs, where do you get the image, and how does it start. So where, where's so, so if you exclude IP ranges, you don't do that in Nginx directly, but you do this in right. We, we don't do that on the pod. The pod is the the simply the service uh, internally. Um, the the cluster components can talk to all all of them can talk to each other. What we then have is per um, currently we have per uh, stripes or per tenant um, actually several ingresses. Um, we have mm -hmm. per tenant the Stripes container itself, and then the the Okapi part, and then here. This simply um, describes okay, 
uh, for which uh, external uh, DNS uh, is this, and then there mm -hmm. are uh, quite a few rules, and then you can have here annotations where you can um, change the the uh, IP ranges uh, from which the, the, this specific service can be accessed. So you are, have quite a bit of flexibility. Uh, yes. But it's also rather complex, <laughs> actually. Yeah. 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 That's one of the areas I'm really interested in, in how this works in, in other environments then, actually. But uh, I guess we will have an update uh, sometimes in the next uh, month or two uh, with Tobias, what worked, what doesn't work, because mm -hmm. obviously the, the uh, how exactly the ingress and the, mm -hmm. uh, the DNS, the external DNS and firewall is set up is uh, different for each um, uh, environment, for each uh, institution, for each um, computing center. Okay. No. Also, Tobias and was it in the chat? Yeah. No, we have two moderators. <laughs> okay. I've so... just made comments, comments, uh, <laughs> comments along. Yeah. <laughs> and I will hand, give this over to uh, Axel. So then I will close the session. If there are no questions from the room. No. No and, questions uh, from the room. Yeah, and, uh, it's, it's quite a complex uh, topic. If there are any questions in the future which uh, come up by reading the slides or anything at all, uh, simply reach out. Uh, we are yeah. Slack. Yeah. Right. If you're interested, just uh, drop by, look in into SysOps, hashtag SysOps. Exactly. But, uh, we have weekly meetings and uh, Yep. Fridays, 10 a.m. EST, and uh, yeah, we will do some talk about this. These uh, two great uh, presentations next time. I will have some more questions <laughs> in, the, yes. in the internal discussion there. Yep. So, okay. but if you're interested, please join. Okay, then oh, thank you. Yeah. thanks a lot to you guys out there on the other side of the ocean. Um, and thank you for all your attendance here in the room. And uh, see you in the next meeting. Thank you. See you. See you. Bye.